Welcome to another video in our, in our ongoing series about tall buildings. In this case we want to talk about the topic of tapering buildings so that they're wider at the base and narrow at the top. Um, this is, can be thought of as a response to the moment curve or the shear diagram for that matter uh, for a cantilever coming out of the ground and we'll elaborate on that point as we go along. We can also think of it as redistributing loads in a favorable manner because when we reduce the mass or the surface area above, we reduce the overturning moment associated with that mass in a seismic event or the overturning moment associated w with wind on that high uh, surface area. So we're redistributing loads in a, in a favorable manner. By varying the cross-section of the building from the base to the top, we are disorganizing the vortex shedding because the uh, frequency for vortex shedding at the base of the building will be different from the mid-zone of the building and the top of the building. And finally, we also have a concept called detuning the building, which we've mentioned before under uh, wind loads and dealing with the issue of dynamic wind loads uh, and we'll come back and just mention that topic again. So most of our uh, tall buildings are prismatic in cross-section and this is an example of a trust to building the Alcoa building in San Francisco. Each floor plate is the same size and shape as the floor plate below. So we imagine this as being extruded up out of the ground with a constant cross-section. We call that a prismatic building. Um, here's some examples with uh, punched openings and walls. So this is a shear wall tube concept, uh, which has, again, the same footprint at every floor, the same uh, floor plan at every floor. Uh, here's another famous example. These two tubes represent the World Trade Center. This is one Liberty Plaza in New York. All these have the characteristic that the floor plate is highly repetitive, which makes the building really easy to build. It also maximizes what we can put on a given parcel of land because basically every level has a large amount of floor area associated with it. One of the downsides though, as we've mentioned, is there's a large amount of mass near the top of this building, which under an inertial event uh, creates a very large overturning moment. Also, there's a large wind surface for catching wind and that creates a large overturning moment. Uh, another huge problem with this particular configuration is the vortices being shed at the base are essentially the same as those at the top and the frequency for vortex shedding is the same all the way up the building. So, in essence, one gigantic vortex gets shed and then another gigantic vortex. And if the frequency of those vortex shedding uh, phenomena is equal to one of the natural frequencies of this building, it can create huge uh, lateral movements of an oscillatory nature. So when we talked about the World Trade Center, we mentioned the fact that it uh, had to have some sort of damping system, which involved a kind of viscoelastic material, which got inserted between a me a two members that got connected to the columns and the bottom cord of the truss. So very slight bits of movement would induce large angular shear deformations in this material, and it was able to work very effectively in dampening the building. To avoid this, we can taper the building. So now the building has a different cross-section at the top from at the base. The frequency of vortex shedding at the top is different at the base. Also, there's just less surface area at the top for creating uh, overturning wind loads. So this is the John Hancock building in Chicago. It's a very gently tapered building, but it gets across the point uh, about how this can be done. Uh, this is another view of the John Hancock building uh, staring up from below. This is the Sears, Tanner, Sears Tower, or uh, more recently renamed the Willis Tower, and I hear it's about to be bought 
by somebody else. So the fact that such a an incredible prestigious address is getting churned over so rapidly as a, a commentary on our rate of economic growth, but also uh, the shifts in economic power. So the Sears Tower, um, first of all, has a changing cross section at various stages up the building with the setbacks that are occurring. So the vortex shedding at the top is at a much different frequency from down below. Um, so this kind of tapering effect uh, disorganizes the vortex shedding. Aside from that, though, it disorganizes the natural frequencies uh, of the building itself because this building consists of nine tubes and each of these tubes was truncated at a specific height uh, to counteract the natural frequency of some other tube or tubes within the building. So we've detuned the vortex shedding and we've detuned the natural oscillations of the building. Now, both the John Hancock building and the Sears Tower are examples of a fairly gentle and gradual taper. We can carry things to an even greater extreme. Uh, classic example being the um, Transamerica building in San Francisco which starts off with a fairly broad base and tapers essentially to a point. Um, the, a building like this is very stable. It has very little overturning moment. It has uh, a marvelous effect at uh, detuning or confusing the vort vortices. It has a downside though that at some point the footprint is so small it won't even handle the vertical circulation. So these two odd shaped shoulders here are to accommodate the elevators that are necessary to get to these top floors. So people might argue that not only is this a very complicated building that has a lot of different uh, modular sizes relative to the windows, it has uh, every floor plan is different from every other floor, floor plan. So there are layout and design issues. Um, and their elevator issues, but um, these are the counteracting negative effects um, and the positive effects are that we get a much more stable structure. This is another example of a tapered building. This is, which we've talked about before, this is the buttressed core scheme for the Burj Dubai and again it's like the Sears Tower in that they have a series of extruded forms which get truncated or terminated at certain levels and that allows the building to be detuned so that the natu natural frequencies are not so strong and it also allows the, the confusing of the uh, vortex shedding process. This is a tapered building which what we talked about it's the uh, proposal from Skidmore, Owings and Merrill for the what will be the tallest building in the world, which is the Kingdom Tower in Saudi Arabia. Now we drew some diagrams in the chapter on beams, sharing sure moment diagrams. So here we had a cantilevered beam which was supported at this end. It's subjected to a distributed load W. We drew the shear diagram and the shear was strongest at the base of the cantilever, tapering straight to zero along a straight line uh, at the free tip of the beam. And then we also drew the uh, moment curve where the moment was most extreme at the base of the building. And it also goes to zero at the tip, but it does so along this parabolic curve. Now a tall building can be thought of under wind load or seismic effect as a cantilever coming out of the ground. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this diagram and we're going to rotate it 90 degrees so that it represents a cantilever coming out of the ground. And while we're about it, we're going to stretch it a little bit to make it look a little more the way we want it to look. So here we have our horizontal distributed load. This is our shear diagram tapering from a maximum at the base to zero at the top. And the moment curve is again, it's parabolic. Uh, starting at a maximum at the base and going to zero at the tip. So if we want to get very sophisticated, we can create a, a structure 
which mimics that moment curve. And one of the earliest structures of this type was the Eiffel Tower, which to this day, even 115 years or so later, is one of the most extraordinary engineering uh, achievements ever. Um, but it creates this curved profile as a response to the overturning moment of the wind. It's a truly beautiful structure. And if you're ever in Paris, I encourage you to spend a lot of time. Uh, these are photographs that I took there. And uh, I spent the better part of two days waiting for the right lighting conditions. Because this structure is so beautiful, it deserves that kind of attention. Okay, this is uh, Bank One, or at least when I took this photograph, it was Bank One in Chicago. And it's based on that same principle. So we have this curved element in the facade that gives it a nice wide base that tapers down towards the top. Now, in a building like this, you discover that it's not exactly a parabola going to a point. First of all, we want some floor up above, so we tend to not typically taper our building to a point, but we keep some width at the top for occupancy. The other thing is that if you look at shear deform uh, at deformation, under shear, uh, the point, the part of the structure that, that begins to approach a point begins to move a lot and whip around a lot. So this shape is kind of a compromise of uh, keeping down deformation and also minimizing moment and shear. So it's not an ideal shape ever. Um, it's, it's a balance of a bunch of different factors, but you kind of get the concept that this curved facade is a natural response to the various structural processes that are going on in the building. This is the Bank One building again. This is another view of it. And then there's the Grace building in New York. And this is also a Skidmore, Owings and Merrill building. Um, and these are all based on that idea uh, that a logical shape for a cantilever is something that varies over the cross section, not as a, a simple pyramid, but as a curvilinear structure. So that ends our, our video on tapering tall buildings, which is partly a response to the moment curve for the cantilever coming out of the ground. It, it redistributes the load by reducing the exposure up high. It disorganizes the vortex shitting so that there's less of a tendency to agitate or oscillate the building. And finally, it's a kind of detuning of the building, which is very explicit in the Sears Tower, but actually applies to all of these buildings in that by doing this curvilinear gradual tapering, uh, we tend to suppress any fundamental frequency for the building and make the building more resistive to wind and seismic induced oscillations.